Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us once again from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We are in the fourth chapter, looking at verses 13 through 18. I invite you now to listen to the good news of Christ. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, illumine for us this word that the message of the gospel may come to us in power. Amen. Every human being on this planet will at some point experience death. Whether it be the death, their own death, or the death of a loved one, a parent, a sibling, a child, a friend. And so, because of this shared experience across the human race, questions have arisen across time, and maybe even within your own hearts. What happens in the afterlife? Is there even an afterlife? Will we ever meet again? These questions and more plague all humans, including Christians. But Paul teaches us today that the Christian has a different grief. The Christian has a good grief. To grieve is natural. To mourn the loss of a loved one is perfectly normal. To be sad, to be downtrodden, to be broken hearted at someone's death is perfectly fine and appropriate and necessary. Jesus grieved at the news of Lazarus's death, his friend Lazarus. If Christ can grieve, so can we. But the Christian has a good grief as opposed to the grief of those who are unbelievers. The Christian's grief is good because of the resurrection of Christ. Paul asserts that because of the resurrection of Jesus, believers are guaranteed a resurrection of their own. Verse 14 of our passage this morning, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that fantastic news? That because Jesus resurrected from the dead, we too, who are in him, will be resurrected as well. And because Jesus is resurrected and is now in heaven with the Father, in a conscious and a real state, we too can be comforted in knowing that we will participate in a real and conscious resurrection. Elsewhere, Paul is adamant that death in Christ is actually far better than a life without him. Have you ever thought about that? Unbelievers have no hope of a better life after death. 
And thus Paul admonishes the Thessalonians not to be uninformed, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Our grief is good. Our mourning is hopeful because of the hope of the resurrection. Remember, death has lost its sting. Christ has won for us victory over the grave. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christian, you should not be afraid of death. I see it all around us. I see it on my Facebook news feed. Christians are afraid of death. That should not be. We shouldn't embrace death. We shouldn't go chasing death. But death should not fear us, should not frighten us. Death should not make us tremble. Because we know, we know it's not a, a supposition. It's not a guess. It's not an opinion. It is true knowledge. It is fact that when the Christian dies, he or she will join Christ their Savior. That is fantastic news. But instead, I look out around on the media and I see people running around scared because of this coronavirus. Yes, we should be prudent. Yes, we should be safe. Yes, we should be healthy. But we need not be afraid. We need not fear. Because God is in control. God is in control of the virus. But more so, God is in control of your destiny. And that gives me comfort. That gives me hope and strength, knowing that I can rely on the good shepherd to guide me, to guide my soul into the afterlife. But this misunderstanding on death is not unique to our time. Indeed, that misunderstanding is what caused Paul to write this portion of his letter. The Thessalonians had misunderstood what happens when a believer dies. Paul uses the phrase when talking about the dead, those who are asleep. This was a very common metaphor in the ancient world. And indeed, it's a good metaphor because it carries with it the implication of resurrection. When the body wakes up, so to speak. But this is not to be confused with the false doctrine of soul sleep, which denominations like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists uh, perpetuate. They say that the soul is not conscious when a person dies, but rather the soul is asleep, disembodied, waiting to be awakened when Christ returns. We know that that is not a true statement. We know that when a person dies, their soul immediately goes somewhere. If they were a Christian, the soul goes immediately into heaven. If they were not a Christian, unbeliever, their soul goes immediately into hell. There is no soul sleep waiting for the end. There is an immediate progression. Now, the Thessalonians had feared that those who had died before Christ's return will somehow miss out on that glorious day of resurrection because they misunderstood what happens when a person dies. They thought that their loved one had suddenly missed Jesus or will miss Jesus. 
And so to answer their concern, Paul bases his response in sound doctrine, in the doctrine of eschatology. Now, eschatology is the doctrine of the last things or the end times. Now, the Thessalonians misunderstood the doctrine of the eschatology, and that caused them much distress, so much distress that Timothy reported it to Paul. And the same thing happens to us, doesn't it? When we misunderstand eschatology, when we misunderstand the doctrine of the end times, it causes us distress. It causes us to worry and to be anxious and to be fearful. We need to have a right understanding of this doctrine in order to be at peace, to be comforted by that very doctrine. And so the core of Paul's doctrine on death, the core of the eschatology, is the truth that Jesus died and rose again. Jesus' death and resurrection is at the very center of the doctrine of the end times. Why? Because eschatology isn't limited to far-off future events. That's the first mistake that we make when we misunderstand eschatology or the doctrine of the end times. We think it's talking about sometime way out there, sometime in the future, sometime that we might not participate in. But that is a narrow approach to understanding eschatology. Yes, it involves a future time. But eschatology, the end times, actually started at the death and resurrection of Jesus. These are the last days. We are in the end times. Now, I don't say I have to scare you. I say it as fact, as biblical fact. Peter, in his climax of his sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, in verse 33, he, he claims that this is the last days and that the last days began at the death and resurrection of Christ. Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits, friends, the first of many, the, the beginning of the harvest, the final resurrection started at Jesus' resurrection. Therefore, when Christ returns, those who have died in union with him will not miss the eschatological blessings. The eschatology, the eschaton, the end times, already started 2,000 years ago. And it will continue and continues on until the point of Christ's second coming. And in the meantime, all the faithful who die will not miss it. So church, if you are a regenerate Christian, if you are a born-again Christian, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, and if you try daily to convict your sins, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then it doesn't matter if you die today next week, or a hundred years from now. Your place is reserved in heaven. God doesn't lose reservations. God doesn't accept cancellations. And so we need not let the terrors of this world frighten us. The terrors, the plagues, the uncertainties of life. Don't let the sinful depravity of mankind dishearten you. There are bad, terrible people out there. They exist in this world. Evil exists in this world. But we should not let that dishearten us. And don't let the threat of death shrink your faith. Too often, far too often, in this day and age, I see it every day 
I hear it every week. There are people whose faith is shrinking because they are afraid of the world. They are afraid of the things going on in this world. Friend, if that's you, if you find your faith shrinking, don't let that happen. Cry out to God to strengthen that faith. Go to the scriptures to shore up that faith. Because true faith will not wither away. We need to support one another. This is why the church exists. Why we must be the church. Why we must have church. Because together we build up one another's faith. Iron sharpens iron. Iron can't be sharpened on air, on nothing, on absence. No. We need one another's presence to build up our faith. To shore up our faith. And since the end times have been in progress since the cross, we need to live as Christ commands us. And what does Jesus command of us? That we be expectant. That we be vigilant. He could return at any moment. Again, I don't mean that to scare you. We don't need to live in fear of that day. Rather, this is how we must live. If we are living expectantly, vigilantly, then we must live ready to die in Christ. Let me repeat that one more time. We must live as ready to die. If you were to die right now, can you confidently say with the psalmist, as for me, I shall behold your faith, your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. If you can, great. Continue to live expectantly. Continue to grow more and more in your faithfulness. But if you cannot respond confidently. If you cannot respond assuredly, then first of all, repent. And then second, cast your cares on the Lord. And then third, submit yourself completely and fully to his If there is an ounce of pride, selfishness, arrogance, self-righteousness, then there's no room for God. Your faith will be weak and depleted if you rely on yourself. Only through submission in Christ does one find comfort in Almighty God. Now, to rightly and fully understand the doctrine of the end, Paul next details for us the event that we commonly call the rapture. And we need to unpack this in order to gain a right, a biblical, a reformed understanding of the end. Now, we do not know the complete misunderstanding the Thessalonians had. That their question to Paul was never written down. Rather, what we do know is inferred by Paul's teaching. So his answer, or because of his answer, through his answer, we can infer their question. And as I said, we infer that their fear was that the dead had somehow missed or will miss the Lord's return. And so in order to comfort them, Paul 
now enumerates part of the sequence of events at Jesus' second coming. Now, it's important to note that I said part of the sequence of events. Paul isn't talking about the whole end times or what it's all going to look like. He's just talking about a very specific point, a specific event in that whole series. And of course, we don't have time right now to unpack uh, the end times. Maybe one day we will. But it's important to note that Paul is talking about a single part or single section of that whole event. And so Paul uses two Greek words that I think we need to unpack because that'll help us to understand his teaching. The first word is parousia, and that is the coming of the Lord. And the second word is apantasis, which is the meeting in the air. We're going to unpack both of those. So the parousia, the, the coming. This Greek word was often used to refer to the visit of the emperor. So if you were to find this word, look it up in a, in a thesaurus or a lexicon or somewhere, you would see that the other ancient writers used this word, excuse me, used this word in reference to uh, a diplomat, an emperor, someone important visiting. And so the residents would go out and meet their emperor and, and welcome him in. So that's what it is. They would... The, the coming, they would rush out there, and, and they didn't want to miss it. It was a, a big event. No one wanted to miss the parousia of the emperor. And so how much more would you want to be present at the coming of Christ? That's the yearning that everybody has to be present. And so the Thessalonians feared that their deceased loved ones would, would miss, they would not get the chance to welcome the king of kings at his return. And so Paul makes clear that the dead in Christ will not miss out on his return. In fact, they will rise first, first from the grave, and they will go first. They will go ahead of the living to meet the Lord. And so the coming or the, the parousia is an event that will not be missed by anyone, by any believer, living or dead. Now it's also important to note that the parousia, the coming, will not be a quiet event. Paul describes it with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. There's a common misunderstanding of the rapture that says it'll happen secretly, quietly. And I believe this misunderstanding comes from a misinterpretation of Jesus' signs of his coming. In Matthew, he says, two men will be in a field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Nowhere in Matthew 24 does Jesus say it will be done quietly or secretly. Sure, the hour of his return is unknown, but it shouldn't be unexpected. And the hour of his return will be known throughout all corners of the earth. No one can hide from the voice of the archangel. No one can ignore the trumpet of God. There will be no secret rapture because everybody will know it. When Christ comes, when the end times are being consummated with his return, with the rapture, everyone will know. It will not be a secret event. Next word that Paul uses that I want to talk about is the apantasis, or the meeting, meeting in the air. At that great and terrible sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, apantasis, to meet the Lord in the air. This 
at Pentasis, this meeting was often used, unsurprisingly, in relation to meeting of visiting dignitary or the return of the emperor. Folks would meet this official with great acclaim and great fanfare. They would join with his, uh, with his troop, with his entourage, and they would come with him and travel with him to the city and through the city up to the castle or the keep or wherever, you know. The, the, the notion is that those who are gathering around, who are supporters of this emperor, will follow him into his chambers. And so Paul, using that imagery, describes that believers, both the alive and both both alive and dead, believers will meet the Lord of Lords as he triumphantly returns. Now here's another common misunderstanding that we see in a lot of other denominations, probably denominations that are very close to us. The, uh, this misunderstanding is that there are two raptures. And this comes from a misinterpretation of a prophecy in Daniel and some of the visions in Revelation. Now again, we don't have time to detail, but briefly, there won't be one rapture and then seven years later another rapture for those who are quote-unquote left behind. That's not what I read right now. That's not what I see Paul says in Thessalonians. Both those who are alive and those who are dead in Christ, believers, will join him at his return. Christ would never leave any of his flock behind. Does that sound like the good shepherd to you? That some sheep would be left behind? Absolutely not. Now one thing before, or one final word before we close, is we need to talk about Paul's purpose in teaching about the rapture. And that purpose is not to spark speculation. Too often when we start talking about the end times, people start trying to find prophecies or trying to predict. We cannot do that, church. If you're trying to calculate, if you're listening to preachers who are predicting and calculating, that is wrong. Repent. Jesus himself says, no one knows the hour. Of his return. And so Paul's teaching on the rapture, on the end times, is so that we will comfort one another. The last verse in our passage, therefore encourage one another with these words, with what I just said. Comfort and encourage one another. Are we living in the end times? Yes, absolutely. But that should not discourage us. That should not frighten us. The fact that the last day's timer has started at the cross should comfort believers. The faithful should be comforted knowing that the end is near. Believers are assured because of the rapture, because of this doctrine. Believers are assured that life continues after death. And believers are assured that Jesus will not lose any of his children, dead or alive at that time. None will be left behind. And believers are assured that no matter what tragedy may befall us, what tragedy may, may befall this generation or the next generation, the truth of Christ's return, the fact of his second coming, the doctrine of the eschaton, that will see us through all tragedy, through all turmoil, through all 
So friend, I hope you find comfort knowing that Jesus will return. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Apostle Paul and his teaching on the end times. Lord, we are so grateful for Jesus' resurrection, which is the core of this doctrine. But more so, we thank you for Jesus' resurrection because we know that it precedes our own resurrection. Just as Christ suffered, we should not be surprised about suffering. And just as Christ was resurrected from the dead, so too shall we. And so, God, I pray on behalf of those around us, those who are sad, who are grieving, who are mourning, Lord, I ask for good grief, for hopeful mourning, because these things come to us in light of the resurrection. Lord, comfort those believers who sorrow at death. Because there is hope. There is life beyond the grave. And Lord, I ask that you be with those who need to confess their own sins, their own follies. Those who need to confess that we are quick to retreat into fear. We are quick to retreat into speculation. We are quick to retreat into doubt. Forgive us for being afraid. Forgive us for our proud predictions. And forgive us for our doubtful minds. And Lord, in that same forgiveness, in that same confession, we ask that you replace the sin in our lives with a right understanding of Jesus' return. Lord, we need somewhat to understand and somehow what Jesus is going to do. And we are so thankful that you have preserved for us the details of that event. The books of Daniel and the teachings of Jesus and Revelation and Paul and elsewhere. Lord, we are so grateful that you have given to us your word. And so I ask, I intercede on those around me to be with them. Open to them your word and reveal to them the assurances that you provide to believers. Because they're there. They're written black and white. And in that, in your word, in your unchanging, in your inerrant word, we find our hope. In Jesus' name.